So key topics to revise in contract law, from my experience, these are the topics that usually come up on the exam, but please still double check it with your, your past exam papers. Formation of contract. This includes offer, offer acceptance, intention to create legal relations, yeah, and also breach of contract. Uh, misrepresentation, mistake, exclusion clauses, consideration, promissory estoppel. Breach of contract case, uh, cases also sometimes include um, sale of goods act, um, and you should be prepared to answer that, those questions as well. Now we are going to go through a problem question, an example problem question, um, that a similar um, problem question could come up on your exam. So it's um, definitely worth it for you to follow my guidelines on how to answer this problem question. In building Society LTD, new case leading distributor of imported construction equipment supplied 10 excavators to a construction company at a cost of 30K. The contract stated that the excavators had to be environmentally friendly to comply with the UK regulations. On delivery, it turned out that they were not environmentally friendly, they did not comply with the regulations, they were polluting with toxic chemicals, and it could not have been used in the UK. Then the construction company spent extra money on finding alternative excavators because they had to resume their construction, and administrative costs were also incurred um, as a result of well, this. Currently, they are pursuing a claim against Building Society LTD. In their defense, they are saying that they are not liable because their terms and conditions have an exclusion clause. Exclusion clause states, Building Society limits its liability to the contract price for any breach of contract expressed or implied. Advise the construction company if they can successfully recover compensation from the Building Society for the loss they suffered. Now, we need to um, list the legal issues that have uh, arisen in this problem question, identify the applicable law, apply to the facts, make arguments, and conclude. First of all, uh, you, could, um, you, you should mention section 13. Section 13 of the Sale of Goods Act 1979. All um, contract for sale of goods, if it's a B2B transaction, business to business transaction, have implied terms. Those terms are implied. Even if they are not mentioned in the contract expressly, they are implied by statute, Sale of Goods Act 1979. Section 13 states that the goods shall correspond to the description. What does it mean? If it's said that the excavators had to be environmentally friendly that it, and it had to comply with the UK regulations, then it had to, to be like that. It, uh, they, it couldn't have been otherwise because it was a description, contractual description. Um, also, you need to identify who is the seller and who is the buyer, right? It's uh, section 61 uh, in Sale of Goods Act and in 79, and you need to use the case law. Bill versus Taylor. Here, only half of the goods corresponded with the description. It was the sale of a car, and um, uh, strangely, the car was like, cut in two parts, and the first half of the car corresponded with the description, and the other half of the car didn't. And the court state said that it was a uh, breach of section 13. Mm, and the court ruled that uh, the importance given by the buyer to the description for making a purchase decision is the key. So the most important consideration is how much value did the buyer place on the contractual description when he was making the purchase? So would he have purchased the good anyways if he knew that it didn't comply with the contractual description? That is the most important factor, and you definitely need to make an argument about that. Here, it, it said that the excavators had to be environmentally friendly, complying with the UK regulations. That's what the contract said. The reliance of the buyer on the description is this is a factor, and this is the case of Harlington. So once you make an argument, you need to cite the case in the footnotes. You don't need to put it in the text. 
most of the times, if it's an assignment, um, a, a course rank, you have limited word, words uh, you can put in your assignment. So make sure that you save some words by placing the full citation of the case in the footnotes. Usually footnotes do not count in the, in the words. Um, at one bill, it can be argued that the buyer would not have purchased the extra basis had they known that it did not comply with the UK regulations about environmental protection. So most likely, it seems that this uh, factor had a big importance. And uh, if the buyer knew that it, it didn't comply with the UK regulation, then they wouldn't have bought it um, because um, they wouldn't be able to use it in the UK. So most likely, it should be the breach of section 13 um, based on the facts. Then you could argue uh, whether or not breach of section 14 is applicable here. Section 14 is um, goods supplied and the contract shall be of satisfactory quality. Um, but what is satisfactory quality needs definition and um, legal authorities have to be cited. Reasonable person test is applied when deciding what are the standards of satisfactory quality. Quality of good, goods include their state and condition, such as fitness for all purpose for which the goods are supplied, appearance and finish, freedom from minor defects, safety and durability. And however, there are differences like and, um, of reasonable expectations must be met. In Rogers versus Parish, expectations of a buyer of a second-hand product cannot be the same as a new product. So if a buyer is buying a second-hand product, the, reasonable, it, the expectations must be reasonable. They have to understand that it will not be at the same quality as if it was new. And uh, fitness for purpose, right? General fitness for purpose. But it is not required by Sale of Goods Act that um, the good is specifically fit for purpose for this specific buyer. What does this mean? If you have a look at the case of Griffith versus Peter Conway, um, it will become clearer. Here, in this case, claimant bought a coat that gave her dermatitis due to an abnormal skin condition. Uh, and the court said that there was no breach of section 14 here because the coat was fit for generally for, uh, for purpose. It would, shouldn't have given the dermatitis to a reasonable person. It's just these, the buyer himself was, um, I was an exceptional person, had this abnormal skin condition that a normal person shouldn't have. So uh, that is why it was not a breach of section 14. Application of section 14, uh, the goods were supplied in the course of the business. The standards of a reasonable person most likely couldn't have been met as the excavators did not comply with the UK regulations on environmental protection and couldn't have been used. Uh, not fit for its purpose to be used in construction in the UK, and therefore the conclusion would be that it would is most likely breach of Section 14 for these reasons. After this uh, concluding that you have um, that it's a breach of Section 13 and Section 14, then we need to talk about the remedies. Uh, remedies is a termination of contract, so the buyer, the innocent party, is entitled to terminate the contract, a reject, uh, the buyer is um, able to reject the goods and uh, damages can be claimed, foreseeable damages and loss of expenditure. For everything, you need to cite the cases. So I'm trying to cite all the cases for these principles here, but there will be also other cases that you could sign aside depending on what the problem question is about. Now let's talk a little bit about the exclusion clause. Um, first of all, when you start discussing the exclusion clause, you need to define briefly what is an exclusion clause, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is its purpose, uh, what does it do? And um, obviously the exclusion clause excludes liability uh, for a party. And uh, discuss if the exclusion clause was validly incorporated into the contract. That's the first step. Not every exclusion clause will be 
incorporated into the contract. There are set of rules you need to apply to determine whether or not the exclusion clause was incorporated into the contract. The case for it is one of the cases is OB Marlboro. Then you need to discuss if the exclusion clause was written in a document with a contractual effect. Uh, that means that um, it has to be written in the contract or in the terms and conditions of the website somewhere where one would expect that it has a contractual effect. Um, and uh, discuss if the exclusion clause was brought to the attention of the buyer. If the exclusion clause is particularly, um, is, is, uh, is not a common one, for it to be incorporated into the contract validly, it has to be brought to the attention of the buyer. So before the contract is concluded, the seller has to tell the buyer about this exclusion clause. Um, and there are also other grounds in which exclusion clause can be declared invalid and you need to consider only the relevant ones. You don't need to list all possible grounds in which the exclusion clause can be declared invalid, just the ones that apply on the facts of the case. Um, these are just a list uh, of um, the grounds on which exclusion clause can be declared invalid, and these are the um, issues that normally arise in problem questions, and I suggest that you memorize it. If implied terms under sale of goods act, liability cannot be excluded for breach of section 13, 14, and 15 under sale of goods act 1979. Also, liability cannot be excluded for negligence and liability cannot be excluded for breach of contract. Um, I suggest that you have a look at our simple study materials on contract law for further information uh, to identify other areas of contract law that you should be revising for assessments. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about simple studying and how we can help you achieve your objectives. At Simple Studying, uh, we, we have a team of law graduates who have achieved first class and high to one in their respective law degrees. And we have created simple study materials that can avoid you reading this huge complicated law textbooks that everyone hates. Um, yeah, and uh, you will be able to use our simple study materials instead of um, big textbooks uh, to um, to, to revise for your exams and achieve high grades. Our study materials are specifically designed to help you achieve a first class in the simplest way possible. It's designed by students who have already achieved it a first class. So uh, they are qualified to give you this advice. If our resources and what we have on our website is not enough, we suggest that you have a look at our tutoring services. Tutoring services are one-to-one -one tailored support. So one thing is to have access to our study materials, which is very helpful for you to prepare for your assessment. And the other thing is that you need personalized support, extra help from a tutor who will be able to talk to you on Zoom meetings um, about every every aspect of your law degree and help you prepare for your exams, help you with your assignments to achieve a first class, right? Um, you can see all the reviews here. We have helped thousands of students um, to improve their grades and 90% of our regular users get a first class. If you would like to be our next student who ends up with a first class law degree, you should um, have joined Simple Study now. Thank you very much for your attention.